coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. The FDA did review the safety, the serious side effects, the efficacy, and the conclusion uh, was really clear that this is really worthwhile to really prevent the transmission uh, of COVID in this age category and providing a safe vaccine uh, and a highly effective vaccine to this age group. Kids between the ages of 5 and 11 could soon be getting their first dose of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. Under the emergency use authorization issued by the Food and Drug Administration, children will receive one third of the adult dose with two injections given three weeks apart. It's important that we reach a very high level of vaccination rate to achieve kind of a wall of immunity uh, that could prevent transmission and prevent us from dealing with these repeated peaks uh, that we've been dealing with over the last year and a half during this pandemic. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, November the 1st, 2021. Can you believe that it's November already? Across the U.S., COVID-19 boosters are being administered to adults and vaccines for kids could start later this week. Vaccinations vaccinations for children ages 5 to 11 will be an exciting step forward in the fight against COVID-19. With us to discuss the latest news on COVID-19 and vaccinations, we have a new face for our show today. Not new to Mayo Clinic, though, Dr. Ellie Barberi is the Division Chair of Infectious Disease. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you, Elena. Thanks for being here today. Um, exciting to chat with you about vaccinations for kids. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's the big news. Uh, we think that uh, the COVID-19 vaccine might be authorized for kids ages 5 to 11. What should parents know as they're considering whether or not to vaccinate their children? Very good, Elena. You are absolutely right. The FDA uh, did authorize the use of the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, for children who are between five and 11 years of age. Uh, this is welcome news uh, and is gonna give opportunities to almost 28 million children in this age category in the US to get vaccinated. Um, on the minds of many parents, is this safe? Mm -hmm. um, is this effective? Uh, and so forth. So let's start with the effectiveness piece. And the, this is really important. Uh, as we're trying to balance the safety versus the effectiveness of any vaccine. Uh, the vaccine is extremely effective, uh, giving protection uh, effectiveness around 90%, very similar to uh, the uh, you know, young adult age group. Um, is that like two doses, Ellie? That's correct. So okay. two doses, uh, three weeks apart. Uh, it is to be noticed that the dose of the Pfizer vaccine is reduced for this age category. And that's really uh, keeping in mind, uh, you know, the balance between the effectiveness and the safety. Mm -hmm. One major side effect in, on many people's mind uh, is, um, is the vaccine uh, safe? And um, the issue with safety is the myocarditis. That's kind of a risk that has been rare uh, but highly publicized in the news, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. It does happen rarely, and it happens more in boys than girls, uh, but it's rare. It's uh, the magnitude of 20 or 30 cases or you know, in, in that kind of uh, uh, category per um, a million uh, uh, administered uh, patients. So it's extremely rare, but it does happen. When it does happen, it's a, it's a temporary problem. It goes away. Um, you know, for that, the FDA is going to be monitoring those cases. Uh, that's one of the rationale for reducing the dose in the Pfizer vaccine. And, you know, there are common side effects, pain and fever and so forth that tend to be, uh, you know, short-lived and they go away after a few days, um, like many other vaccines. So uh, the FDA did review the safety, the serious side effects, the efficacy, and the conclusion uh, was really clear that this is really worthwhile uh, to really prevent the transmission uh, of COVID in this age category and providing a safe vaccine uh, and a highly effective vaccine to this age group. Ellie, what would you say to parents who say, but I have heard that when children get COVID, that it isn't a very serious disease. Sometimes they don't even know they have it. 
Yeah, um, that's true that for most fine. kids, but not for all. Um, you know, we have data to show the, the risk that could lead to hospitalization and occasional death in this age group. So uh, certainly still uh, a, a risky proposition. Most kids do well, like most adults, but not all. And I think we're trying to prevent that. And also we're trying to prevent the chain of transmission. Um, you know, it's important that we reach a very high level of vaccination rate to achieve kind of a wall of immunity uh, that could prevent transmission and prevent us from dealing with these repeated peaks uh, that we've been dealing with over the last year and a half during this pandemic. Okay. Now on to boosters, Ellie. We um, have been talking about uh, kids, but now let's get back to adults. We keep hearing that they're going to expand the indication to give boosters. And one of the um, uh, groups last week was those with um, mental or mood disorders. Now, what yeah. does that include? So, Elena, you're absolutely right. Uh, the CDC is really keen on fine tuning the list of indication uh, for boosters shot. Um, and this is, there's a long list on the CDC website that includes, um, you, you know, cardiovascular diseases, immunocompromised conditions, and so on. And, and the most recent addition is mood disorders. That's mostly depression, uh, some schizophrenia, but some others. This is really stemming from a large meta-analysis that was performed that showed that uh, patients with these health conditions are uh, at high risk for complications from COVID. Um, same with having an immunocompromised conditions or under underlying cardiovascular conditions, and therefore would benefit more from a booster. Uh, and this, these conditions were included uh, as of late on the CDC list. Okay. Anything further from the CDC on immunocompromised individuals? I think the this is an important topic and keeps getting refined. One of the things that we have been doing, and we all know that uh, immunocompromised patients would do benefit from a booster. Um, and you know, there's a little bit of a distinction between a third dose and a fourth dose for this uh, category of, of patients. Um, mo you know, there's uh, support from the CDC saying that a, an immunocompromised patient, especially in the kind of moderate or severe immunocompromised categories, they might benefit more from a third dose. That's not a booster. They're just a third dose in addition to the first two dosages. A booster is typically one that's given six months later or more uh, that can also boost that immunity and that the level of neutralizing antibodies. And those patients would benefit from that booster. So in total, some of those patients may get four dosages as opposed to uh, two or three dosages in, in the rest of the population. Ellie, I think there's still a lot of confusion in the public about why should we still mask and socially distance? There are some stores require it, some don't, some buildings do, some don't. And what's the, what's the scoop on that? Yeah, uh, and you know, the public is right to be confused. And a lot of it is because of the understanding of the pandemic is evolving and the knowledge is evolving. We've known all the way that any intervention alone is not enough to stop this pandemic, including the vaccination, our best strategy right now that we can deploy. Mm -hmm. Even if we rely solely on vaccination, we can't stop this pandemic totally. So we have to rely on multi-layered approach. And you know, if I put those in kind of in, in, in the list, vaccine is certainly on top. Masking would come second. So we really need to rely on a multi-layered strategies to prevent the spread and really uh, get over these these kind of uh, you know surges that we're seeing uh, over the last uh, two and uh, two years or so. So masking does add to the vaccine because the vaccine is not 100% effective. Um, and in high risk situation, especially in an indoor environment, in healthcare situations, school situation, and so forth, the risk of transmission is higher despite. A, a relatively high level of vaccination, and we need to add another uh, intervention, and masking is our next best thing. And Ellie, is it true that um, those who have been vaccinated can still carry the virus, even though they may not exhibit any signs or symptoms of it, or, but pass it to someone else? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's really something that we've seen more of with the Delta strain. Uh, that's called the breakthrough cases. So a fully vaccinated individual could still acquire COVID and transmit it to others. Um, what the vaccine does, it's prevent that individuals from developing a more severe illness. So mm -hmm. uh, now the vaccine is still effective at preventing uh, an individual from getting COVID, but it's much more effective from preventing that individual, if they were to get COVID, from developing a more serious COVID, needing hospitalization or worse, intensive care unit stay. So um, breakthrough cases do occur, and they do occur, you know, especially later on, month and month after the initial um uh, you, you know, uh, vaccination series, and that's where boosters may come into play. Ellie, I saw a really interesting article, it intrigued me at least, about using an antidepressant to treat COVID-19. Is that effective and why? Why would it work? Sure, um, uh, it's it's intriguing and we've seen a number of, of drugs that we don't associate typically as being antiviral uh, in this field. Um, and fluvoxamine is an uh, antidepressant or used in obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there's a, a study I, uh, that you're alluding to from Brazil that has compared patients who received fluvo uh, fluvoxamine to not receiving it and showed that there's a re uh, reduction in the risk of progression to severe disease. Um, and uh, it's a little bit unclear why that happened, why that's the case, but possibly related to some immunomodulation that may occur um, as a result of taking this uh, uh, antidepressant or antipsychotic. And I think, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend that we use that as our primary agent. We have a lot more effective drugs that have been studied in larger studies, uh, but it's certainly intriguing and it's certainly something that would warrant further studies and analysis. Well, speaking of research, I know that you keep your finger on the pulse of COVID-19 research. What are you most excited about right now? There's a lot of excitement, uh, Elena. If you look at the last year and a half, how where we started, where we didn't have anything uh, in the management and where we are today, and not only in prevention, the vaccination, which is really a remarkable, remarkable uh, disruption to the COVID, but also uh, implementation of a number of drugs that we did, didn't exist before COVID, and now we know are very effective. Um, several of those drugs have been proven in large scale clinical trials and are very effective. Monoclonal antibodies in the way they work uh, is an extremely uh, effective intervention, either from preventing um, one from getting COVID if they were to be exposed or preventing the transition to severe COVID early in the treatment. And Mayo Clinic has had really great success in implementing, uh, you know, administration of, of the monoclonal antibodies. Um, there are a lot of newer drugs on the market. Uh, there's an, uh, an oral drug from Merck that's extremely effective and I think will be a game changer. That's easy to use in the outpatient and seems to be safe and highly effective. Uh, and if available on a large scale, I think can be also uh, another um, agent that we can use. Um, more and more studies uh, combining these uh, strategies and how to combine them and when to combine them are being done at this moment. And I think this will add more clarity to the management of this disease. So think about this. We started with a disease that's potentially deadly in three, 4% of individuals it would put 10, 15% of individuals in the hospital requiring months or weeks of prolonged stay and 30, 40% of individuals with long COVID. You know, this is really how we started. Mortality has decreased. We're preventing more than ever people from getting admitted. And even better than that, preventing them from getting COVID. And if they do get COVID, preventing them from going to the hospital. If we transformed a relatively a deadly disease to a disease that can be managed where we have strategies and effective strategies that prevention as well as effective treatment. And that's, that's really remarkable. And if you think about how we deployed that, why can't we deploy that for other serious infection or other serious illnesses such as cancer and others and, and really disrupt 
research and how we do research uh, in, in, in these conditions. So this is exciting. It's, it's a roadmap of how we could accelerate the discovery and even better than that, the implementation of discovery and understanding that there is hesitancy in, in many of those interventions too and how we deal with that. It really is amazing, Ellie. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh. I was just excited. I, I think that what we have seen with COVID is akin to decades uh, that it has taken to make progress in other disease states. You're absolutely right, Elena. What we used to do in years or decades, we're now doing in weeks and months. Um, and the vaccine story is, is a remarkable story. Typically it takes 10 or 15 years from the conception to the implementation, it took us a few months. Um, and that's just a remarkable discovery, not only discovering the vaccine, but administering the vaccine. I mean, if you think about the scale of administration, which is uh, akin to the delivery of care, right? It, it doesn't help if you have the best management and we can deliver it or the best prevention strategy and we can right. deliver it. So the execution of the delivery is so important in the space. And we learned as a nation, as a world, how to do that. We're still learning. We're still not there yet where we want to be. There's still a lot of barriers and hesitancy. Uh, but I think we're learning as we go on how to do that and how to implement a disruptive, a disruptive intervention and implement that intervention uh, in real life. And, and that's remarkable. And again, those learning is gonna allow our society, our healthcare uh, institutions to translate that into other fields in the future. Well, Ellie, we always have questions from our savvy listeners that we like to get to. So the first one is, if an individual has had COVID-19, is the immunity that they um, gain from actually having the infection different from what they would get from a vaccination? You know, that's been a hot topic, Elena, for quite some time. Um, and, um, you know, there's been quite a bit of studies. And, you know, one of the things about COVID is, you know, our knowledge is evolving, right? What we knew a month or two or three ago is changing today. Um, and so, there was a little bit of discrepancy and contradictory data. Is, is immunity from natural infection better than, say, the immunity from the vaccine or vice versa? What we knew is that having both is better than either. That kind of we knew. Uh, there's large studies that supported this. There's a CDC study that was recently published that looked at the trying to answer what you just said is what's better? Is it the vaccine or the natural immunity? And from that CDC study, it seems like the immunity from um, uh, the vaccine is superior at preventing COVID. And they did a large study and looked at the risk and it's about five-fold more protective. So in essence, the vaccine affords a five uh, you know, times more protection against having COVID than a natural infection. Um, natural infection does afford an immunity and protection, but not as good as a vaccine. So we still recommend that folks who have gone through a natural infection, you know, after they're symptoms free to get the vaccine. Um, and I think that really affords the best scenario for those individuals. The next question is from our Mayo Clinic Connect transplant group. They have heard an expert uh, physician on national news discuss that um, those who are immune compromised, such as have had transplants, may not gain antibodies or develop antibodies after having the vaccine. So perhaps they should be treated with monoclonal antibodies uh, prophylactically or preventatively. What does Mayo Clinic say about this? Yeah, uh, you, you know, we do know that individuals are immunocompromised and certainly transplant patients are in that category. Um, are at higher risk. Um, and if they do get COVID, are at higher risk for se severe disease. Um, so that's the reason why a third dose is recommended for those individuals from a vaccine standpoint. So if, if those individuals have received the initial series of two shots of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, they are to get a third dose and eventually a booster. So in total, they would get four dosages to compensate for the fact that their immune response to the vaccine uh, is not as robust as if they were not immunocompromised. The monoclonal antibodies is an interesting uh, adjuvant. And let's say an individual who have received a series of two shots are exposed to somebody who has COVID. 
they may be considered for monoclonal antibodies because of the fact that they may not have received uh, or may not have developed antibodies from the vaccine itself. So they would be considered like they have not received a full vaccination and therefore would be eligible potentially for monoclonal antibodies. Those discussions are done on a one-on-one -on -one cases and, and not in kind of an open fashion that everybody would fit in that category. It depends on the level of immunosuppression, where they are at in their transplant journey. Are there other mitigating agents or drugs that they are taking that could make them uh, more immunocompromised than they otherwise would be, and therefore might be considered for a, a shot of monoclonal antibody in case they're exposed to somebody and that exposure, exposure is deemed high risk. Okay, and another topic, Ellie, flu shots. It seems that we are lagging in giving flu shots this year. Not as many people have had them uh, at this point. Why is it still important to get the flu shot? Well, I mean, the last thing we want is a twin pandemic, is 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 an ongoing COVID uh, pandemic, and and another influenza uh, on top of that. So I think it's important that we get both the, the COVID vaccine and the influenza vaccine. Uh, we are um, watching what's happening in the southern hemisphere as a prelude to what, what might happen in the northern hemisphere. Uh, Elena, last year. Uh, we didn't see much uh, of influenza cases across the globe. Uh, it, it's really, well, there were a few hundred cases, which is remarkable. This has never happened, um, you know, in, in modern history. And so I, I think it's, uh, we're watching what's happening. What we're seeing is that there are more influenza cases in the Southern Hemisphere uh, than there were last year. Um, and we are seeing a bit more cases uh, in the U.S. already. Uh, still very early to tell. Uh, it may end up that this is going to be a, another mild, uh, uh, you know, season for the flu. Uh, but it's important that we get the influenza sh uh, shots because influenza is still serious, and influenza could still lead to hospitalization. Uh, and many of the conditions that could uh, make COVID more serious would make influenza more serious. So, uh, really, very important to get both the COVID shot uh, series as well as influenza shots. Great information. Thanks, Ellie. Any last words to share today? Um, no, I, I, I just want to kind of reemphasize the fact that no drugs and no vaccine is effective without being utilized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's intuitive to think, but it's very challenging to implement large scale drug administration or large scale uh, you know, vaccination across the world. Uh, there are logistical challenges, there are financial, socioeconomic challenges, and we're witnessing that unfold in the US. And I think unless we really can understand those challenges and find solution for those, we will not be able to really get on top of this pandemic. Um, you know, this is a virus that can mutate, that can transform, that can kind of reinvent itself. And we have to really continue to be vigilant and implement the tools that we've created and the science that created uh, effectively so we can really put this at bay uh, where we could control it to a point where we can go back completely to a normal life, semi-normal life. Words of wisdom, and we all want that. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Take care. Our thanks to Dr. Dr. Ellie Barberi, Division Chair of Infectious Disease at Mayo Clinic, for being here today to give us our COVID updates. I hope that you learned something. I know that I have. We wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.